Hi, my name is Rahul. I am part of a fund called Stellaris Venture Partners. We are an early stage fund based out of Bangalore. Uh, I've been investing for the last 17 years, been an operator before that. And very uh, happy to meet everybody here and looking forward to the session. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Uh, I want to kind of uh, understand the journey of becoming a VC. Um, first, tell me this. How do you rate yourself as a VC on a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, I would say still very early in learning uh, what makes a good VC. So maybe around 7 out of 10. I think you're being humble, right? You, you were one of the first VCs in India, if I'm not mistaken. Like, if one was to count the first dozen VCs in India, you would be in that list for sure. Uh, but uh, why do you say 7 or 10? Like, what, uh, what is your critical self-analysis which makes you say that? So, actually, I think, you know, this is one industry where every few years you need to re-innovate yourself. There is no one formula that works. Uh, industry around you change, founders change. Your relevance in the industry change and it's a success finally that matters and you know after one success you want to get to the second and the third uh, i think i've missed out on some great opportunities in the last 17 years i've been investing i've been fortunate to be part of some good ones uh, you know the fact that those founders allowed us to partner with them but i wish i had more uh, and i only worry about whether i'll be relevant over the next five years wow amazing uh, the opportunities you missed out on was it a, uh, I mean, it could be just like chance, you know, I, I just happened to make a bad choice. Or was it that you had a fundamental approach uh, which proved wrong or, uh, and then your approach changed after that once you realized, like, like what, what, uh, what went wrong that you missed those opportunities and how did that lead to a course correction? No, very important or interesting question, I would say, Akshay. I think in my early days of the career, as I look back, I feel I was evaluating wrong pieces. Uh, I was anchoring on a dimension that actually doesn't matter in long term. Uh, give me uh, give me examples. Like, can you share some details? Now, uh, you may imagine a company like Flipkart. Uh, I was thinking, how large is the book market? I didn't even <laughs> okay. Okay. figure out okay. it's an e-commerce company which will start with books. Right. Uh, uh, you know, so those are the kind of mistakes you end up making early in the career and. As you rightly said, we were one of the earlier, you know, the there were not too many uh, past uh, history to uh, to learn from. So these were all first principle based thinking. But I think I have corrected that. One piece which I still feel is always an issue is our ability to imagine. Uh, I was able to imagine in few areas. So like a big basket or a live space or a mamar. But I think there are a lot of categories. I still fail to imagine how, where can this go? And in early stage, you know, uh, it is founder's imagination coupled with your imagination, uh, uh, which may work, may not work, but there are some dimensions just, it is still a struggle for me. And other investors get it right. I don't, that, and that is okay. As in, I can't, I don't know how to, you know, I can be even maybe incrementally better, but I don't know if I can be dramatically better over a period of time on that. I want to zoom in a bit. You said you were evaluating on the wrong dimension and one dimension being the category. Uh, what has become the new dimension now on which you evaluate instead of just looking at the category? Uh, so again, one is to listen to customers and founders more versus your own personal views. Sometimes our personal views do create, um, I would say, biases. So how do you balance your past learning with what founder is saying? Uh, and then putting yourself in founder's shoes to actually see is it practically, business-wise, commercially, is it possible or not? Uh, uh, and, you know, luckily, again, with 17 years of experience, there are some lot of past patterns to follow. Like when we did Mamar, it was a baby care product company. It was a single brand. Now it's a six brand in a more broader personal care category uh, business, right? At that time, I don't think I had the imagination to figure out it will be six brands uh, in five years. Today, if I see a new brand, uh, while I may have a view on the size of that particular brand, but I, if I talk to the founder, at least I can, I have more belief in, you know, their ability to launch multiple brands and become large, uh, as an example, in a category. Uh, monetization, okay. sometimes, you know, used to be, people start with commerce, we look at margins in commerce, but today you see companies who don't only do commerce, they do commerce and lending. So there is a margin expansion that happens 
when you were in when it's an adjacent category when it's a revenue driver on an existing customer base so those are the kind of things that i would say my dimension has improved where i am okay taking those uh, you know or i am okay and now let's say i believe in commerce plus lending but if i don't feel that it is possible in that particular business at least i have i have i've evaluated on the right dimension uh, i must still reach a conclusion that doesn't make sense uh, because okay. there is no pool in lending in that particular business hmm. okay so you're saying the ambition of the founder is uh, something which plays a bigger role in your assessment plus probably the ability to execute uh, exactly so and, it's a and, mix yeah. of the two it can't okay. be one of the two uh, because i can have ambition to become i don't know you know bill gates but if i don't have the ability to do it how will i become so it's a mix of the two that matters uh, so in that sense you know what in our industry we call don't invest in bleeding edge invest in cutting edge uh, 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 okay you know there is only so much of foolishness one can have uh, you <laughs> need uh, you can't have all the pieces sorted out on day one uh, mm-hmm. but you need a good mix uh, i want to kind of uh, understand your journey of reaching to where you are today uh, and uh, as we discussed you were one of the earliest vcs in india just tell me how that happened so akshay as a person i am not a very planned guy uh, i find that you know when you talk to youngsters today they have thought process around how they want to build career most of my career has been uh, very uh, serendipity driven uh, so i belong to a town called kota in rajasthan uh, this obviously the city has become much more famous now because of you know multiple education institutes out there were your parents was... in education or some allied Field of no, my my father is an engineer, mother is a doctor, so they were not okay. uh, from education industry. But coincidentally, both the Bansals and Allen, uh, both those families used to also work in JK, which is my father used to work. So I had a like I in some sense grew up uh, when some of these folks uh, were coming around. Okay. Uh, so I ended up studying at Bansal uncle's classes, uh, but again very early days around his dining table and all is how he used to study. Wow. Went to. I did my engineering from Kanpur, MBA from Calcutta, uh, and my first job was at BCG in consulting. Uh, you know, just and it was all just because everybody wanted to go to consulting. I also went to consulting, so not too much thought was given. Best paying job. Really liked. Sorry. Best paying jobs, I guess, at that time. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So I liked consulting for multiple pieces. One is this. You know, you you get to see what is the CEO's problem. Uh, at that age, at 24 years, uh, it is a very, very uh, you know different experience to care about what does a large conglomerate CEO you know what problem do they want to solve. Also, you get to work in multiple industries. So I really like that, but I thought it was too early in my career to advise a 40 year old or a 45 year old on how to run their business when I myself had no business experience. So I ended up joining a software company. Next seven years, I was an operator. Uh, Uh, in product management in three different software companies two in us i2 and market rx and then came back to india it, it must have been very early days of product management right even product management exactly. as a principal would have just started to yes. get formed yeah. there okay yeah no i was at the right time uh, in that sense got to learn in early days from some of the better folks in us and then came to india again part of the product management team mostly on the application software side uh but i realized over those 3 4 uh, roles including consulting that i am not somebody who thrives in a large company uh, i liked environment which was smaller more you more action oriented uh, more doing on your own uh, uh, so from microsoft you know it was just coincidental helion and several other funds had just gotten started uh, from outside venture looked very glamorous to me that you know you sit on board of founders you give them money and you you in some sense you seem to be in a you know in a controlling seat uh, uh, and it was a small setup so uh, and and as you rightly said product management but itself was new and helion at that time wanted to add that expertise to the investment team so uh, again coincidental uh, ended up joining helion i was not sure whether i'll stick around even there again uh, but uh, i really liked investing So I stayed nine years out there. Multiple. What, what was the journey. backstory of Helion? Very quickly, who started? Is so, it started by Indian uh, founders? Yeah, so the three GPs, GPs Ashish, Sanjeev, and Kamal. Uh, uh, two of them 
had been successful entrepreneurs kamal uh, was a seasoned uh, consumer product guy uh, and also an investor uh, uh, at uh, carlyle before these three took came together to start helio uh, it was uh, one of the most premium venture funds uh, amazing platform lot that i learned out there it was also early days in 2007 and 8 you know uh, what what tech companies had call centers to take orders Uh, that's how <laughs> large tech uh, or the broadband penetration used to be. Right. So two million broadband users, ten million internet users. That would be right. So not easy, but uh, uh, you know the good part is uh, there are only six, seven, eight maybe venture funds. So everybody, every founder you could meet, spend a lot of time, understand what they are doing, and take your picking. So that was a good part. Uh, the bad part is we were all learning from our own mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, yeah, it happened. And then 2010, I think is when 11, 10, 11 is when the inflection point of smartphones happened. Uh, but I think 2012 we had like close to 100 million smartphones or 100 million internet users if I remember it right. And that's where the journey really, you know, the scale really happened. Again, partnered with some very interesting businesses. Uh, as I said, Big Basket, Live Space, Simply Land, Topper, ID Fresh, and so on. So I was lucky to see those journeys, and then 2016 is when Stellaris got started, and three of us came out. What was the thesis at Helion? What kind of businesses? And it must have evolved. So very but... similar to what we do at Stellaris, which is early stage, so seed and series A. So either somebody with a business plan, to somebody who's just pre PMF, uh, wanting to raise their first round of institutional capital. So that is where we enter at Stellaris as well, and that is similar to Helion. Uh, also. mostly tech enabled businesses or tech companies and uh, mostly founders from india so yeah i i guess somebody with just a business plan would uh, that round of funding would be called pre seed right uh, yeah so you can call it pre seed uh, 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 but we do that quite actively at stellaris uh, so we are very comfortable taking those bets okay uh, obviously we are in some sense as a fund we are very sec or thesis driven So wherever we have a existing thesis, we are and we find a great team. We are okay backing them with a business plan also. Uh, and as I said, uh, we are okay backing companies who have just launched their product, who have just barely started the revenue. Uh, but generally, we are the first institutional pool of capital that they uh, raise money from. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, what was uh, the the reason for you to leave Helion? You were a general partner at Helion, and uh, just tell me a bit on how the VC. Uh, organization chart works like in, yeah so you know, like, see there are a couple of hmm. roles that you will see at most venture firms now titles might be different uh, there is a code and code and analyst role which is generally i would say it's not a long term career track uh, it's a 2 to 3 year kind of a role mostly pre mba folks people with one or two years of experience want to know how venture works uh and they are great in building networks great in sourcing uh but after 2 3 years they might start their own companies do their own mbas or do something else so that is one broad uh role that you would see in a vc then there is this role which is more an associate or a vp role uh, uh and there the job is to be on a long term career track so you get involved not only in sourcing but also in full fledged diligence but you are still supporting somebody else to lead a deal so and different firms might have different policies but like in our case uh, an associate or a vp while they are supporting somebody else like a md or a principal uh, they sit on boards as a board observer so you are in some sense a shadow to the main board member the next is where one, you one lead your quick question a vp here is venture partner or vice president sorry so, vice president okay yeah. okay uh, the next is a switch which is you are the main person on the board but maybe a partner is shadowing you and again different titles but let in our parlance it is called principal where you take the conviction to take a bet or you build that conviction but then on boards and all you will have somebody shadowing you as an observer and then the next is where you take your own calls you get your deal sponsored and you are the only board member you don't need anybody support in the board right so in terms of investment that, that are, next level uh, what is that called so again different people have different titles some people call it junior partner some people call it md some people call it may call it partner uh but gp is slightly 
different role itself. Uh, see, GP is somebody who is doing a 10-year commitment to the fund. The GP is somebody who... And a GP stands for generous part. Whose is there when LPs are investing uh, in their money. Uh, in some sense, the IC literally is what LPs think of them is, is the GPs of IC, right? Because they know that finally it is these five folks or three folks that we are backing for this fund. Uh, so it need not be that somebody who's a MD is also a GP. So there is a transition. Uh, you are also in that point of time, you know, you are no longer, uh, you, there's no longer a, a, a employee kind of salary uh, in some sense, right? You, you are a risk taker. Uh, you say I'm 10 year committed, I will do this. Uh, and then, you know, if, if there is money left after paying everybody's salary, you get it. If there's none, then you are okay taking a cut. So the economics are also slightly different. You have more profit share uh, in that case uh, because you are the one taking the risk. So uh, that would be a GP uh, in, in the investment role. Okay, okay. So, and just for our listeners, GP is general partner, LP is limited partner. LPs are limited partner, investors, please. basically. And uh, Yeah, LPs are essentially investors in the fund. They are called limited partners because their main job is to invest, but they are not the ones taking investment decisions. Uh, GPs are the ones taking investment decisions. Right, right. right. But they are partners because they are stakeholders in the fund. Okay, and and IC is the investment committee, which uh, has the IC final... is the investment committee, yes, no people decision. who vote. Yeah, who vote on investment decisions. And see, when you are running a venture firm, it is investment decisions are the most important ones. But there are a lot of other decisions. So like strategy, right? Uh, some fund might decide, let's do series Bs. So there's a strategy difference. Uh, hiring, uh, very critical because we are not, you know, we are not a fund. Fund doesn't hire like 100 people and doesn't add 10 new people every year. It's a small team. Uh, so hiring is very important decisions a decision to be taken. How large is the next one going to be? So those are all fund level decision. Uh, beyond the IC investment decision that uh, you will see happen. And uh, typically GPs are also the ones who go out and raise money. Uh, like that needs exactly. to be one of the skills to be a GP. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, so you need to, it is like any other sales job. You need to convince somebody to give you money, believe in you for the next 10 years. Uh, and people who are who make those allocation calls, uh, if they are global, they have, you know, they have an opportunity to invest in a fund in China, in Israel, in US, in India, in Japan. So you have to justify why you are the best opportunity for them to invest. Mm, okay, okay, interesting. Uh, so at uh, Helion, uh, were you uh, like at an MD level or a GP or what? What was? Uh, you can call us. We were. Title was partner, but it was more what I was describing as MD. Uh, okay, okay, okay. And uh, so you wanted to have your own fund. That's the reason why you left, or was there a like a directionally yeah, that you was had the a main reason thesis or something? Yeah, so slight difference in how we wanted to build. Uh, uh, and as I said, Helion is an amazing platform, but we had certain thoughts on what we wanted to build as a franchise, uh, and we thought let's do it on our own. So what yeah, were what were those things that you wanted to do? Like, what was the vision you started it with? Yeah, so our view was that obviously at an overall level, our view is to build India's premium uh, top tier venture fund or early stage in India. That is the vision. Now, how you do it, uh, different people might have different philosophies. Uh, but when we started, we felt that one, uh, just in terms of focus. Uh, we only wanted to do one thing. So we didn't want to do multi-stage. We didn't want to do multi-geography. We didn't want to do multi or non-tech, which some venture funds used to do at that time. So we said, let's do only one thing and do it well. Uh, second is how we service the entrepreneurs. Uh, so there is a certain philosophy in how Stellaris is. And it's a culture that starts internally and then, you know, kind of get uh, projects or gets projected uh, externally also, right? And internally, it is a lot about giving everybody a voice, uh, giving everybody clarity on their careers, uh, uh, right? And and respecting each other's views. Uh, so that is one thing that we have tried to do from day one, and it it is easy to put that in a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, 
but very hard to execute on a daily basis mm-hmm. uh, right so uh, and uh, i will just struggle to give you exact examples but the best way is to talk to either ex employees or employees at stellaris on how we function as a fund uh, also how to build stability of partnership i think one of the thing that you wanted to address is that this franchise better last beyond the three of us uh, so there is a lot of thought given on partnership structure uh, uh, and you know we have all gone through our ups and downs but i would say for the last 8 years there is a lot more confidence on stability of the partnership and hopefully ability to add new partners uh, and see for any new investor in the team if they are great investors they will obviously ask a question why not start my own fund Uh, hmm, and right. ideal case for us be if you are one of those folks then this is your own fund over a period of time so why why do anything else right so and that is how we deal with founders also in some sense it is about respecting their understanding of the business we actually feel we don't know anything about it we can try to scratch the surface uh, but the best we can do is help them share our experience from past and see if it applies to their current business and second is ask right questions as in because of some past experiences i can ask relevant questions uh, but answers have to be you know generated by them they they have to feel that they finally arrived at the decision uh, and it is theirs to you know if it fails it fails if it succeeds it's theirs only so i think that is very important when you are dealing with founders and it requires some patience you know as an operator in early days i always used to think why you know why can do this better why why are why is somebody not realizing it <laughs> uh, but you know everybody has their flaws and strengths so hmm. i have my own flaws hmm. so realizing that you know finally it is a, if i'm backing a founder i better back them uh, 100% hmm. uh, uh, so yeah and the third one is how we structured internally and allows us to win the deals externally and that is where you know while we as a fund we are a generalist fund we do everything within tech but as individuals we have tried to build very deep expertise in our own areas so if somebody does saas they only do saas if somebody is doing fintech they only do fintech and so on i if i get to see a fintech deal from my own network i will not work on that because i know i'll be i'll make a fool of myself trying to invest compared to somebody else in our team who spent 10 years investing in it and that is something that gets projected when we deal with new founders they realize our you know expertise is a big help to them they also feel they are talking to right set of folks so those are some of the structural pieces how we have made the fund different uh, in the early days we also got support from some of the most well known founders in the country by investing in us uh, and it had multiple strategic advantages uh, give me some these names. are not so we have people like founders of big basket Okay. Founders of Lift Space, uh, founders of India Mart, uh, you know, founders of Capillary, uh, founders of Udan, uh, several CXOs of Flipkart, uh, Mintra CEO, and so on. So, you know, these are super angels. Uh, by getting them as investors, it allowed us one access to their own deal flow. Uh, but if you think of any new founder today, they are coming from one of these late stage startups. Right? Uh, so it also allows us to get a peek. uh into their past journeys uh in those large companies uh because when we are investing in early stage most of our belief and thesis is investing behind that founder right. or their ability to build a large company so that better you know we should have done enough work on that front so yeah so some of these pieces helped us early on uh this group still stays very important to us or uh, even in the second fund that we invest in and uh What is the total amount that you have raised so far, like the so amount available to deploy? Yes. Yeah, so today, between the two funds, are uh, we have about over three hundred million dollars uh, to invest. The second fund, which is the what we are investing out of, that is two twenty five million dollars. Okay. So the second one is like a three x four x jump over the uh, first fund. In the first fund, you would have proved out, uh, like, done the credibility building, proved out the thesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, and we also build the team. So in the first fund, it was just three of us who were the main folks sponsoring these. Now we have six people, including three of us, who sponsor deals. So there is more capacity uh, within the fund to do more deals. And clearly, between seventeen and twenty-three or twenty-four now, seven years, the la- venture landscape is also 
broadened a lot. As in, we used to see, uh, I think about 800, 900 deals a year in 2017. We see more than 3,500 deals a year uh, last year is what we saw. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. Also with larger team, more coverage as in, in 2017, we used to see 55% of deals that other investors did. Today, we see 90% of the deals that everybody does in the market. So, okay. it allows us, uh, you know, to see almost everybody who's raising uh, from quality investors. Okay. Okay. Uh, you must be getting like thousands of deals every month. So, what do you mean when you say you saw three and a half thousand deals last year? So, that includes everything. That includes the inbound uh, and outbound. But I, So, about that, 300 deals a year, a month is what we get to see. In Just was, new deals. I think there are a lot of past deals that you number, right? Uh, because being yes. early stage means there is a lot of noise in that, right? Uh, exactly. So, so ours is the needle in hashtag business. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so the, this three hundred is what you receive inbound after some screening filter, or total is three hundred that you receive. So I would say these are deals that get logged into our CRM. Okay. So somebody so has somebody would have seen it, read it. And then said, let me log into our CRM. Okay, okay. Now, we might say no to a lot of them over an email itself. Without an interaction, we might have one call. If somebody finds it interesting, then we have two calls and so on. And that's how it progresses. Okay, okay, okay. Understood. Interesting. Uh, what is the... Uh, you said you want to serve founders. Uh, like, you know, you want to give them more service. What does that mean? Like, beyond money, what else do you give to a founder? So... Uh, Again, it, it, that support or service change from stage to stage. The ground floor we enter at, uh, I think it is a lot about just brainstorming uh, with them and being an objective partner in their journey. Uh, so, you know, each founder has a passion for why they start a business. Obviously, there is a financial motive, there is a business to be built, but it is always an emotional angle or a part to their, uh, of their ambition of their desire to start a company, which is great, which is what keeps them going in tough times. Uh, our hope is that we we help cover up for any open questions in their mind uh, where they can brainstorm. We help them build the remaining part of their team. So organization is the second piece that we help. We have internally uh, somebody who just does recruitment for portfolio companies. Uh, so making them aware of what could be the right organization, where could these people come from, sourcing, interviewing, and so on. Uh, but those are a lot of discussions around what is the right business to build. Uh, should I take a, this call or that call, right? And there are always choices when you're starting a business. Should I double up or should I be more careful? What will the next year fundraising environment look like? Uh, what is the right margin structure in my business? Should I acquire customers more openly or should I... Again, hold back and be more careful. So those are validation, sometimes questions that founder is seeking our views on and help on. Also, in early days, there are a lot of support functions that they don't want to hire for. So like finance, right? While everybody understands the importance of compliance and governance, it is just hard for them to hire a CFO from day one. Again, we have a three-people finance team and a good part of their time is just helping them structure their compliances, their governance requirements. And board members help structure the MIS. And MIS is not just numbers. It is about what is important to track. You know, uh, and setting uh, those matrices, sitting with the founders. Uh, and then creating a discipline, almost on a monthly basis, going over it. Uh, uh, and multiple times I found, especially first-time founders, who after three, four months will come and say, you know, this whole cadence of doing stuff monthly helps us sit back and take a view uh, every month on where my business is. Otherwise, when you're running a business, there is no time. Like every day looks like a new day. You are just, you know, just going with the flow in some sense. Uh, but those are some of the things that we do when we are uh, early. Uh, once there is a PMF, uh, you know, these companies need ranks on a financing. So they are looking for our support and also looking for help with external support and getting uh, them ready with what is the right pitch, what is the right amount, who's the right investor to talk to. Uh, that's another area of help uh, that I would say we do. Uh, and then as stage changes, you know, requirement for the company also change. If they have figured out one category, then question is, should I enter another category right now? What is the right category? Uh, if they have entered one market, then they might say, I want to enter another market. So there are always expansion plans that kicks in around series B, C timeframe. 
uh, that they got in, in, involved in. And then, you know, at some stage they will say, should we go public? If they go public, what do I do two years ahead of time? So those are, uh, uh, you know, things that happen. So depending on the stage, we, we, we figure out our strengths and service the founders accordingly. But at a very, very high level, I would say, I think the most important piece is understanding uh, or putting ourselves in founder's shoe and understanding their pains and then responding accordingly. I think that is there. And I don't, don't want to claim that we are best in the world around that. We all have a lot to learn. But that is one continuous reminder that we give to ourselves or you know, tell ourselves that that is our job. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and if, if we can make them succeed, they'll, they'll make sure the company succeeds. Right, 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 right. Amazing. Uh, what is uh, your specific area of expertise? You said everyone at Stellaris ha- focuses yeah. on something. What do you focus on? So most of my focus has been, and this is over the last 17 years, has been mostly around consumer businesses. And within consumer, so I'm taking out fintech, health tech, mobility. Those are also consumer businesses, but that's not what I do. Most of my consumer focus, one is around commerce. So be it a consumer brand, be it B2B commerce, be it B2C commerce, that is one broad area. The other is consumer tech, uh, which could be an, uh, which could be a, a digital content, a social media platform, a gaming company, uh, a creator economy company, and then edtech. So these are the three broad themes of sectors that I spend most of my time on. Okay, interesting. Uh, what is, uh, you know, for a, an edtech company, like you said, you help them figure out what metrics they should be looking at, what matters in an MIS. One, an MIS can't be a one-size-fits-all. So w- what do you tell tech companies in terms of what metrics and uh, what their MIS should look like? Yeah. So again, it depends on the stage of the business. I think the most important piece and mostly gets missed by tech companies is, is customer getting the promise that you gave them or is the promise getting delivered? that you gave them and you sold a program. And I'm more talking about, let's say, somebody doing coaching, somebody doing tuition, somebody doing test prep and so on. Obviously, there are other kind of, you can have an ed tech software company, you can have an ed tech community company. So I'm not talking about those, but the mainstream of the market, which is where people spend money on. Uh, are you delivering the promise? And that is about efficacy. So can you, or do you measure on a monthly or a quarterly basis, how is the performance of a student improved? Uh, by doing your course. Uh, to me, that is the North Star matrix. And if one can solve for that, you can solve for most of the problems in tech or most of the customers will come to you for that particular problem if you can solve for it. You know, the whole notion of CAC and all that all goes away because the customer will stick around, stay with you, will pay you the money if you can deliver the promise. And if you look at the offline behavior of ours, I think as, as Indians, we are for our kids, for ourselves, we'll pay, you know, whatever is needed if I can get high-quality education. So there is no reason why an edtech company can't uh, tap into that market. And the way to judge efficacy is like through assessments or maybe through... So multiple ways. Uh, in See, if let's say you are teaching somebody uh, for an exam which is one year down, you can't, you know, today figure out whether this guy will succeed or not. That might take you a few years uh, to predict but in early days, then you look for quarterly or monthly results, which is what you do is you start, a, you do a very simple test at the start of the month. You do another test on same topic, end of the month. Uh, you do for one topic, you do it for multiple topics, right? So breaking down that one year into multiple smaller pieces and then seeing whether it led to any performance improvement. And see, again, performance is also in some sense, let's say one month out performance is dependent on how much this person is spending time with you. So on a daily basis, are you seeing engagement? Are you seeing papers and you know and lessons being completed? Uh, so a lot of things that can be done to find whether the product is fine, is useful for the student or not. Uh, uh, and yes, one year down the line, finally, if you have promised them an entrance exam preparation, then are you able to get ranks in that entrance exam? That is what matters. Okay, interesting. Uh, what about for like gaming and content kind of companies, which are like not in that so, serious? See, again, depends. So like we have invested in a company called Dash2, which is in the content space. They are building a web comic platform for global consumers. But the back end, they use Gen.ai to help anybody with an idea or a creator to build a web comic. 
so reducing the cost of content generation for a con- comic creator at the back end which allows what instagram did for pictures in some sense it can do for comics that if you have an idea you write it on a piece of paper and automatically generate comic out of it right so that is on the back end side the front end for a consumer is great content and it's a format uh just like you go to instagram for pictures you go to tiktok for short videos you go to netflix for high quality movies uh this is a for, or you go and read novels when you want to read books uh, textual format this is somewhere in between where it's graphic but it is better more richer than a novel but less richer than a video right so it's a format so what matters is are you able to get hours or minutes how many hours and minutes of a day of a person are you able to get to spend on your platform because we all have certain time of the day that we use for entertainment purpose this is one of the entertainment formats that is where the business starts from and that is what matters on day one now clearly you might have different monetization angles so some people like youtube would say i am monetized based on ads so they will have a different view of measuring whether the revenue potential is getting realized or not which depends on quality of users time spent on the platform and so on in their case it is more revenue for or revenue that user is paying for viewing the content uh, so it is pay per view model so you get to see few episodes free every day and then if you want to see further episodes same day you pay if you want to see free you can wait for one day and then see them tomorrow right so there is that uh, hook that you need to have uh, no doubt everybody will do it maybe 2 3% of users will actually pay but that is where you generate your revenue from so different level of pmf but the first one is are you able to get people to spend time on your platform that is what matters in an entertainment business hmm. okay and then probably next would be how many convert into paid. yeah so those are all downstream points you're right uh, and see conversion is also depend on your price i may be okay paying 10 cents for the next episode somebody suddenly you see conversion change if you make that pricing 7 cents right so you have to find that balance uh, on you know what do you want to monetize or what need you want to monetize for and this is very similar in gaming also the whole in app purchase is all about or ads it's all about intrusion in some sense or friction but you have to create only so much friction otherwise you lose the audience uh, so you have to find that balance and it takes time it is not there is no answer on day one you start with some hypothesis and you tinker around to get to the right uh, number over a period of time hmm. okay interesting interesting uh, there is this uh, concept of power law in uh, venture investing uh, what is that what is so see uh, ours is one of the highest risk uh asset class we enter a, and you know my parents still don't understand what i do and how can i do it uh you know we invest in a company uh, there is no collateral no debt no security there is no business most of the time uh, there are just three founders or two founders to starting the company uh an idea which sounds always sounds crazy when we invest like if it sounds normal basically then we are not taking enough risk right uh, <laughs> so in some sense by nature however good an investor we are a lot of these businesses will fail uh, right so the concept of power law is one is that you know this whole concept of high risk high return so somebody lets our lp is investing in us they understand the risk they are taking but for that risk they want high returns so it can't be a stock market return right if that you are getting 12% year on year and i deliver 15% that's not good enough for there is a risk percentage attached so for that to happen uh and the fact that let's say we make 20 investments we know a lot of them will fail the concept of power law essentially is that the ones that succeed should overcome for all the losses and provide the high return that that investor is uh, taken a bet on uh so in that context the ones that succeed and let's say 20% companies succeed which is a great outcome for a venture fund uh, out of 20 let's say four succeed uh, those four need to deliver each company needs to deliver let's say 20x on the capital invested 30x on the capital invested for the fund to return 4x 5x right so that is all that means it means the power law and that is why there are certain investments that are good for venture but there are certain where 
I don't think founders should raise venture money. They should build their own business, and they are also great businesses. So it is not a value judgment on a type of business, but there are certain businesses where I think venture w- investment. W- makes what's sense. an example of each type? So again, you know, uh, harder to generalize. But let's say you're setting up a chain of uh, uh, movie halls, or you're setting up a manufacturing plant for. Uh, Or let's say for uh, assembly of certain auto parts, or you're setting up a steel plant, right? Now two different buckets. First one, if you try, and because venture industry also has a timeline in mind, a lot of funds are like ten year, twelve year funds. They need to get to that large outcome from zero to outcome within that time period. Now there are some. Com- if you're setting up a cinema, chain of cinema halls, movie halls, the amount of capital you need to grow very fast is quite high. Uh, similarly, for a steel plant, no venture investor can fund a you know two thousand crore steel plant. It might be great return, uh, but who will take that risk uh, or that amount of money? In the first case, you don't know what kind of cinema movie halls will work. Uh, so you should, if you start in ten on day one of first year, you will make mistakes in locations, in you know the size of the movie halls, and it is very hard to undo those kind of things. So there are certain investments. Uh, Or a manufacturing plant for auto suppliers. There is a certain ROC you get. You have fifteen percent margin, twenty percent margin, but it is plant at a time. So these are an example of a business that can become large, but need not be venture investable. Okay. The, so the venture investable, I think, are companies which start with smaller amount of capital, can scale fast uh, in that time frame. If those characteristics are there on day one. Then I would say those those are one that we qualify to be venture investor. Also, I guess like a large uh, TAM, like a total addressable market should be large for it to be venture. Yeah. So again, you know, um, I should have mentioned this. I have struggled with this notion of TAM, and I that was another mistake I made in the early part of my career by trying to exactly pinpoint size of the market. I see multiple cases where founders uh, find market expand. As the service expand, so you look at an Ola or Uber. When we invested in a company called Taxi for Sure at Helion, a Rishi Mal partner led that investment. The total cab market was two hundred thousand cabs in India. That is what the supply was. So you try doing whatever math you do. That we'll run this cab, we'll get every cab on the platform, and we'll give them eight hours, ten hours of customers. You still can't figure out how is it a large market. Today, Ola alone has more than five hundred thousand cabs within their system, and then Uber will have more. The market expanded. Now you can again, you know, the counter argument can be why were you looking at supply? You should look at how many people travel by car. Uh, but you know, so we all have our own ways of imagining market. Mahmoud, when they started, uh, the baby care market was a billion dollar. How will you get a today? The company is a two billion dollar market cap company, right? Uh, the brand itself had a certain value prop. Now they have six brands, so you give them another ten years, they'll have like twenty more brands. So what is market? Like what is the size of the market? That is for in early days very very hard to define, right? So you you try to see the beachhead market is that large enough, and then is the founder ambitious and can evolve to find new areas uh, that they can expand into. Now it can be totally different area. So you can't say I'm a fashion brand and tomorrow I'll launch a taxi app because that's another interesting market, right? Uh, so yes, you have to build on your strengths as you become larger. Uh, so which is why I struggle to put an exact TAM uh, into the equation when we are coming into the company for our stage. Interesting. How do you judge ambition of founders and uh, you know the? Ability to execute. Uh, I mean, these are the two things you over-index on: ambition of founder and ability to execute. Uh, how do you judge these? So uh, it is a bit tricky. Uh, and see, ideal cases when you get to meet founders over a period of time, uh, and you see their thinking evolve. But a lot of times we don't get the opportunity to do that. So uh, a part of that is talking to their past colleagues. If they worked, their their team members, their managers, uh, in different industries, you 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 know you get to hear whether they were pushing boundaries, whether they were stretching, 
or were they comfortable in what they were doing? So somebody is satisfied versus somebody wants to you know look for more bigger and bigger things. Uh, at least on day one, on the onset, you know this person wants to uh, you know build something more or always strive to do something new. The second is the idea they come up with that itself gives you a sense of is it is it groundbreaking or not? And if it is not, then also you see a reflection. If it is more of the same. Then it's a reflection of, you know, lack of ambition, uh, right? Uh, and a mix of those two, and then time spent on logic. See, I can build a plan which says I'll be a five billion dollar revenue company in five years, but what is the underlying logic? Have they thought about it? So there is a mix of ambition and reason that needs to be there. Uh, just one of the two won't help. Uh, and that is what we try to assess. Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, are there uh, are there signals also that help you judge? Uh, for example, like a couple of VCs have told me that introductions from portfolio companies is a strong signal for them. Or uh, so that to me is a signal of hassle. Uh, whether you know they uh, they are okay just sending a cold email to our contact ID, or they will take the pain to find one degree connect and get an introduction. Uh, if the introduction is for somebody that they have worked with in past and that person is respected, clearly it matters. Uh, it gets you on top of the list for people to talk to. Uh, but to me, that is all sign of hassle. Uh, see, intros only get you in the first conversation. Right? Post that, it is up to you to win or lose or convince or not convince. Uh, and that is a lot to do with the founder themselves uh, on whether they're able to showcase that or not. And I see, I also don't want to, I also want to be careful that there are a lot of time when appearance can, can be misleading. Uh, and which is why it is hard to judge in a very small frame of time. If we had luxury of time, I would ideally meet founders six months ahead of their fundraise. Uh, you just be with them to understand how they're thinking of the business. Uh, uh, you know, without naming the founder, I think I was lucky to be part of their company in Helion. And that founder struggled to present uh, to anybody. Even to a two people sitting in a room, they, that person just struggled. Today, you will see the amount of, you know, Instagram reels and TikToks and all that. But founder himself does. Not the team is doing it. They are doing He is doing it. So he's more comfortable. No. Because of this, that discomfort, sometimes he may not be able to communicate uh, his ambition. Which is why I think appearances can be misleading. But unfortunately, I don't have a very good way of covering up for that uh, in 100% cases. Just a little bit zo uh, zooming into this. So the founder was struggling to present his ambition, his vision. But you still invested. Man. Okay. But you still invested. Yeah, because what, what was again, the... this was slightly later stage business. Okay. So we could see the love for the product in the okay. market. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. So there are other, and which is the other realization about a founder? See, finally you have to find some spike in the company to get you interested or excited. Sometimes when when you are doing it very early, it is mostly the founder. But if there is some business, you can see, you know, over the three four years, they have just out executed everybody else, and created a winner in the market. Right. So then, what you are saying is, can this winner become a much larger business over a period of time? So that is a bet you are taking. Uh, but, uh, you know, when they are very early, as I said, sometimes I might be overlooking things that matter just because of how they are able to articulate, communicate and so on. Amazing. I, I love your humility. Uh, it's simply phenomenal. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, what is the way in which exits happen? Uh, and, you know, that also must have evolved over the years. Probably during the Helion yeah. days, exits must have been much harder. But just overall, how do exits happen? How does the VC firm finally get the money back? Yeah. So, there are two. See, there is an exit for the company and there is an exit for a VC firm, right? And sometimes they might be different and a lot of them they are common off. So, I would say one of the better exit paths, at least in India, I would say is to go and list. Uh, Indian public market is quite... Uh, you know, quite well priced. Also, they don't get to see startup uh, getting into the public domain and 
you know becoming market leader and listing so there's a lot of demand for those kind of stocks so i think the best outcome is if you can list it also but the, the on the other side it is also it also requires a lot of commitment from the founders to continue running the business after it is listed because vcs and investors will exit but they still have to run their business for 10 years uh, and then one day maybe find a replacement as a ceo and all but they need to be committed uh, right so that is, listings i am guessing would happen like maybe in you know 0.01% of funded startup yeah so i am talking i am starting from the top okay uh, and i am talking see i am also there is a uh, i am more also talking about those uh, big outcomes first right so if you want a big outcome either you list or you get sold to a very large competitor or somebody wants to enter into the country those are two ways to get large outcomes uh, the third way for investors could be selling to a much later stage investor so i enter at seed or series a if the company is doing series f at that time if let's say our fund has made 20x 30x we may want to sell some portion of our stake uh it allows the company to raise money from that investor because that investor is looking for certain ownership company lot of time by that time don't need lot of primary capital so it serves everybody's need uh let's say investors ours and the founders uh and that's third kind of exit uh these are the three where you get large outcomes mm. uh there's a middling one which is you still sell the business but not at a very at a very you may be at a series b series c stage so not a great outcome for the fund uh, but at least it gives a home for employees and at least i would say founders also make good amount of money even in those cases so it's a win win in a case where company is not necessarily going to be a market leader or have not been able to figure out a large market to build a business in uh, so that is the second and the third one which is not a great outcome for anybody is company closing down that's not an exit that just uh, shut down the business uh, or uh, as, uh, like a sale at uh, like less than what they've raised that yeah that is that is more people call aqua hiring or aqua hiring okay uh, uh, where it is more acquisition for team more than anything else but in my mind i'm just broadly clubbing it as a shutdown only uh, because great teams find place some people like this so mm. uh, are uh, the legacy indian businesses uh, how how open are they to like you know fund startups either as lps or in acquisition or acquire hiring so uh, i think compared to maybe 5 6 years back the 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 scenario is very very different very positive so over the last few years you would see the number of aifs uh, that have been created and a lot of that money that they have raised is from family offices in india uh, or corporates Uh, so that is a good pool of capital that is emerging it is still young uh, i think people are still learning from their first phase of mistakes and so on uh, uh, you know this is something that you see well practiced in us and europe but i feel it is still young uh, i think as these families are still understanding the risk appetite that they need to have they need to be comfortable that one fund might in a franchise may not deliver so great returns and hence you if you are committed you commit for three funds but those are kind of thing that i think will happen it is still young journey in terms of corporate acquiring you would see like people like you know look at the number of companies startups reliance and so on are required so i think that appetite i wish was more but i think it is on the right trend uh, it will only increase from here on they all want to embrace technology want to get into new areas uh, new channels uh, new brands so as that happens uh, more and more of those acquisitions will happen uh, help me understand the startup investing uh, ecosystem in india broadly like uh, you know how much of investment in startups comes from domestic capital how much comes from foreign capital what are the you mentioned about aif so so what are the different structures through which startups raise money or through pe- through which people invest in startups and yeah so if you think of a startup raising money there are multiple type of institutions or people they can go to to start with there are angels uh, or super angels people who are individually investing their own money uh, either sporadically or very proactively most of that money is domestic uh, that is coming from people hnis or startup late stage founders and so on then there are early stage funds so people like us 
then you will have again series b stage series c stage late stage and so on i would say on the institution side most of the capital is still foreign uh, okay. in recent time that mix has changed but most of the money from global or if you look at or uh, funds that are global brands in india uh, all their money is global uh, they they may not even have a vehicle in india all of that comes from uh, let's say singapore based vehicle and so on and that's all foreign uh, then public market clearly that is mostly india money uh, uh, though there are foreign institutions also who come so beyond india i would say the 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 mix has been mostly foreign but the percentage has shifted a lot over the last five years as more families and corporates have made started making fund investments uh, so that shift has happened the the structure generally again two three types when individuals are investing you know they create these spvs or they do direct investing as angels uh, there are platforms like angel list and let's venture who allow you to create these spvs Uh, to make both investments, uh, uh, funds is like ours, angel networks also, right? Like Mumbai Angels or like Inflection Point Ventures or yeah. So too. I I call them all in angel or micro VC category. Okay. Uh, see, when you are when you are raised a ten million, twenty million, thirty million fund, most of the money is domestic. Okay. Like hmm. you might have some individuals from global market, but most of that money is domestic. So the angel list. Angel network or Indian angel network, they are all domestic capital. Sometimes they invest in their own capacity. Sometimes they invest through a vehicle. So you might have an SPV for a particular company that you invested in from IEN and so on. Okay. Okay. Uh, VC funds. Now we are seeing a good mix. There are few which are more AIF and gift city based funds. And, and what uh, is what what does this mean? What what is the implication of being AIF, AIF? is alternate investment fund vehicle. This is uh, something that you register with SEBI, so it is in some sense there are different categories out there. There is a category which is only to invest in public market. There is a category to invest in small investment and so on. So, like for example, Stellaris has a AIF which is a India registered vehicle. The advantage is that vehicle can raise money from Indian institutions, Indian individ individuals and so on. So the domestic capital gets routed here. Uh, you might have a foreign pooling vehicle. So people might have a vehicle in Mauritius, in Singapore, and so on. Or Gift City, uh, which you mentioned, that is. Or now Gift City, which is gaining a lot of traction. Uh, and the point there is that instead of getting ten foreign investors individually into the AIF, you get them in one vehicle in Gift City, and then the Gift City can either directly invest or invest via AIF. But the whole the whole hassle of you know getting a PAN number in India. Uh, filing our annual taxes that so, hassle goes away for people who are coming into that gift city way so when gift city will file one single tax return follow all the tax laws of india and so on so it is less hassle for people who are coming in um, uh, right so that's the advantage of uh, those kind of vehicles. is this something that's unique to india the fact that uh, foreign capital comes through some other route Uh, I don't think it is unique. As in, you know, if you are, and sorry, I don't understand international jurisdiction as well. But I assume if you were to start investing in US, you will have to do some kind of tax filing in US. Hmm. Uh, okay. Right. Because US will like to know what did you do with the profit? Did you pay tax or not? But if you create a pooling vehicle there, let's say in Delaware, then that pooling vehicle does all that effort, and it's less hassle. Uh, there's some cost which. One has to incur, but at least that hassle goes away for those investors. Okay, 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 understood. Yeah. Okay, uh, how much of your capital is domestic uh, in in this two twenty five so, million? So uh, I would say about seventy seventy five percent of our capital is global. Okay, and about twenty five what percent would be more domestic. A and how did you learn to raise global capital? <laughs> that must have been a journey in itself, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and uh, that's a very, um, I would say, uh, an amazing experience. Uh, you know, as I was earlier saying, uh, I have never done sales in my life before, but it is sales. Yeah. And when you are doing your first one, you are you are the product that you are selling. There is nothing else. Mm. You can talk about all the past track records and so on. But if somebody is giving you million dollar or thirty million dollar, finally they are giving it on a promise. 
right and how do you convince somebody so clearly that was a journey it was not easy and interestingly this is 2016 is when we were raising uh, most of the global lp questions are more about india more less about us because that time was when the ola will survive what will happen to flipkart uh snap deal and so on so we were answering questions that were not ours to answer but we have to answer had to answer yeah uh, you had that credibility of helion uh, so so the question was yeah so it that. helped that clearly helped a uh, lot of our founders from that portfolio supported us uh so that gave credibility to our uh you know efforts uh so i would say the fact that several individuals in the industry supported us was overwhelmingly a positive response that i had not expected initially mm. at that time so that in some sense told us about our own equity beyond the franchise that we were part of mm. so that clearly helped mm. uh and then you need in this business to at least get the fund moving you need one or two key initial supporters and then things start to happen and that's what happened with us we got two or three institutions who committed to us funds we had enough individuals uh, from late stage founder community portfolio founders of ours uh, and that got us into business uh, once you are in business you know a lot of things go your way uh, uh, as i say you know most companies when they succeed they can give all kind of reasons but i feel 70% of the reason is just external alignment of things. right place right time right so that is not in your control and that was true for us also we put lot of effort we put right effort but we could have totally failed in a different era but in that era we succeeded and that got the the train starting uh, amazing how humility runs through your answers it's simply amazing <laughs> <laughs> i love that uh, okay how did uh, fund one perform uh, have there been any exits on it so far and no again uh, you know quite lucky to partner with some of the most amazing founders of that era so one of our portfolio companies mamar from first fund went public last year so that was a great outcome for the fund uh, i think we would have made like 40x plus on that particular investment uh, we have a company called whatfix which is not yet public but doing very well uh, great traction they are a global market leader in what is called digital adoption category uh, we were the you know the series a investor in that company uh, when they were less than half a million dollar here so that has uh, been able to do well we are in a company called propel which is an edtech lending again amazing execution in unsecured loan their cohort of bad npas is less than 1.5% which is totally anado wow and growth mm. uh, and capital efficient in, in terms of burn also so and there are another 6 7 companies in first fund so first fund you know both in terms of money return we are already done very well but also in terms of current multiple that we are sitting at and the net error i would say we would be in the top decile fund in the emerging market for that vintage wow amazing so, so performance has been great but as i was saying initially you know the clock restarts with every fund mm. <laughs> so uh, while one successful fund is great we still need to find you know find ways to make our second fund successful it is still young it is less than 3 year old fund Where, some great company fund 2 was in 2020 i guess then 2021 that is okay. when we raised our second fund so, uh, so yeah, i am wondering 2021 uh, valuations are very different from today's valuations uh, did that uh, i mean did that cause some amount of readjustment of so akshay the advantage of being in industry long enough is you there are enough mistakes you made in past so when we were starting stellaris you know one thing we realized is there has to be some method to the madness and at a fund level we felt that there has to be you can't suddenly become bullish or bearish about uh, startups in india just because market is behaving in certain way okay okay so what we did was that because ours is not see we don't enter today and exit tomorrow then market sentiment matters right but when we are investing today for investment 8 years out or exit 8 years out uh, i have no idea to know what will indian market look like 8 years from now so i have to invest assuming fundamentals are going to trend in the right direction 
and in that context i can't be intelligent to say this year is the best year to invest and next year is the worst year to invest right because i am really, i think it is no global vc has been able to do that so there is no reason why stellaris can do it so the way we have built our thought process is start a fund you have a size so seg- second fund in let's say 225 million we decided that we'll invest this over three and a half years and what we said is let's now figure out a pace of investing based on how much we want to reserve for follow on and how much we want to do in the first check so the number we arrived at was eight or nine companies in a year and then 2021 started we had our fund in early part of 2021 and market was crazy there are investors who did 30 deals in that year <laughs> we did eight deals that year okay uh, we we basically said we have to raise our bar there is no other way because it can't be that india suddenly becomes so attractive that you do you know double your pace but next year when everybody was holding back we did nine deals that year so we have to be okay both ways we can't be we can't say we will do one but not do the other uh, right so we can't and we have realized again this is again a hindsight realization it is very hard to predict in that year but the hindsight realization is best investments happen when everybody is bearish uh, so 2017 when we made investments in companies everybody was bearish and some of our best companies were that year's investment uh, and early 2018 similarly you know if you look at investments cilion made in 2008 uh, in 2012 those are all gloom or gloom times of india and that is when best companies got created uh, so again these are all hindsight because you don't know whether 2008 is a bad year or 2009 9 is going to be even worse <laughs> right setting in 2008 uh. but you need to be okay taking those investment bets so in that sense while we don't blindly invest but our investment pace is like an sip of mutual fund that we have we know we have to deploy this much amount broadly now if in that year we don't find a great company eight might become seven also but we don't want to become a you know don't want to start investing in 12 companies in a year if our pace is it if our pace is 12 we'll do 12 mm-hmm. but that is how we maintain a constant pace of investing and in that context when the market is hot we have to say no to certain kind of deals now sometimes the deal could be where we don't believe in the business sometimes the deals are where valuations are too high for us to get the right ownership so the way we adjusted in 2021 when as i said we did less eight deals only whereas others is more we also did more seed deals than we did series a because series a rounds were very very expensive mm, right uh, in that deal seed rounds were slightly expensive but there we could still get the ownership by investing another half a million in that company but series a ke liye wo possible nahi tha with our fund size so that's how we adjusted our strategy and then next year we did more series a uh, you know like valuation of publicly listed companies is like a well understood subject with lots of books and you can use discounted cash flows or number of other methods to arrive at a fair value how does valuation work in like a early stage startup at seed level where there is no such thing as a discounted cash flow because you don't even know what a cash flow would be like yeah. one year down the line yes so in our point of entry it is a math about what exposure are you okay taking and what ownership you are getting in return uh now that exposure has multiple facets one is are you giving enough to the company so that they can get to the next stage and next stage will have different definitions depending on the sector if you are in saas investing in a business plan you might say they should get to at least a million dollar arr before they go for the next round so is there enough money for that and there is an assessment you do second is the kind of business if you need to invest in inventory and there is a minimum order size you need if you give lesser capital the founder can't even prove the business right so that is the other one the stage of the business if the business is already running versus they are just going to build how much capital are you okay taking the risk and different funds will have different uh, risk uh, exposure math some fund might say i am okay doing a 5 million dollar business plan bet somebody might say i am okay taking a 2 million dollar business plan bet so that math varies from fund to one and then the ownership that am i getting the right ownership as i was earlier saying if i invest 1 and 1/2 million and i get x percentage but i want 
not X, but 1.25X, then I might be okay investing another 300K to get to 1.25X. And if my risk exposure for seed is up to 2 million, then 1.5 and, and 1.8 million actually is not too much of a difference. Mm. So it is that ownership and exposure that matters. As you become slightly, let's say when you raise series B, then a lot of time your valuation is based on your revenue multiple and your gross margin structure. Later on, it becomes more margin oriented. So over time, and when you become public, I think it is a question of your profitability today and what you can get two years, three years out, which is determined by your margin expansion and your revenue growth. What ownership do you look at at a seed stage company? What is a comfortable number? Yeah, and again, little bit varies, but between 15 to 20%, by the time Series A has happened. Okay. Uh, that is something that we care a lot about. Uh, and we see a lot of great founders. Hopefully, they'll build large companies. But if you are not getting the right ownership, we struggle uh, to partner with them. And wh why do you want this kind of ownership when other funds are happy Again, with less? Again, you have broad math that at the time of exit, let's say uh, you are a $1.5 billion outcome. In a base case, success. So see, even those four or five outcomes that come out, they have different levels of outcome, uh, right? So base case, let's say one and a half billion, let's say you own with all the dilution by that time, you own 10%. Uh, then you, you will get $150 million for a success in a $225 million fund. If you get four such successes, then you get $600 million. It is still not a great outcome. Like you still made uh, less than 3x for your investors till now, right? Uh, out of those four companies. The assumption is one of those four will not be one and a half, but will be larger than one and a half. It could be three. It could be four. We have no way today of knowing which of the four will be that. But there is a belief and assumption that it will happen. Uh, and again, remember, today where I'm sitting, I'm talking about six, seven years from now. So market cap of companies will be larger. Indian stock market, Indian market will be larger. So there is certain outcome size that will go up. But if you think of this math, if you don't start in 15, 20, there is no way you land at 10. Right? Because as an early stage investor, we'll do seed in series A, we'll protect our ownership in B, some in C. After that, we can't, we'll dilute. Hmm. So that path is very clear. Uh, and it is hard to underwrite 5 billion outcomes on day one. That all 5 will become, or 4 will become 5 billion. Hmm. Then the math could be different. Then you're okay with lower ownership also. Hmm. Hmm. But, you know, we all have our own optimism. As in, when I look at Indian public market, 5 billion is not a usual large outcome. It's a really large outcome. Yes, 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 yes. Exception, yes. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, you said uh, 3x of, like if you do 3x uh, of what you raise, it's not a great outcome. Uh, yeah, because for our investors, right, they have to... Uh, there is a profit share that happens. So this is the gross. The net will be much lower than that. If they have to, they have to, like say, a fund takes 20% carry. And what uh, does that mean? Of that, you, just help me understand carry how basically fund means, earns. Yeah. So the big outcome that we are all working for financially is the profit share from our successes. So at a fund level, if I have made 600 million dollars outcome and 225 is a principle basically that is 375 million dollars of profit and then you get 20 percent of that right so in this math let's say broadly you got 75 million dollars and that is then distributed to everybody in the team and so on but in this case uh out of the 600 75 is gone as carry so what the investor is getting is only 525 on a 225 million dollar Right, so it is like maybe two and a half x, mm. net. Uh, which is like okay. Yeah, but in equity, he would have got similar. Uh, like if you just yeah. So you know. think of this math now. You know, which is why we need to shoot for very large outcomes. Uh, but this math is like okay types. It is not great. It is not bad. Uh, but if I am an LP in that fund, I want more. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, you know, I, I've been reading about foreign capital getting uh, switched off from the India story because 
there are not enough exits and uh, startups are overvalued. Uh, well, I just wanted to hear your take on that. So I would disagree with that statement. And I'm talking, if I look at the last one year of India, if you look at the public market performance, if I look at the number of new investors who have come to meet us, and we are, no, I don't, uh, I will not call ourselves as, you know, the first fund people will think of. We are still, we hope one day we'll get there. But that number of people who want to meet us has gone up 10x over the prior years. So, and part of that is to do with how China has performed. Uh, okay. uh, part of that has to do with the macro view on India. You know, the size of the economy, young population, tech-enabled population, growth rate of the economy. Make on multiple counts, clarity of policy. Uh, on multiple counts, people feel that if there is another large market outside US, they can invest in. India is the market. Hmm. So I feel we will see oversupply of capital over the next 10 years. In fact, I worry about it. That, you know, it shouldn't change our behavior. I think our behavior as a community is is much better now than it was in 2021. So I hope we don't change our mindset. But I think we will see oversupply of capital. Uh, in a particular year, you might see mood go up and down. Uh, in fact, I would say public market, it, most of the startups are not like overvalued. What needs to happen this year is there are so many of them lined up for going IPO. As and when they become successful outcomes, I think it gives a lot of confidence to people uh, who have invested in startups, who have been LPs in funds to say large exits can happen. So trending in that direction, another year or two, we'll see a lot more outcomes also happen. Hmm. Okay, interesting, interesting. So uh, uh, let me end with this question. You know, in general, what advice do you have for founders, uh, you know, specifically founders who want to raise from a fund like Stellaris? So, uh, so see, we, we, one is, as I said, we like founders who are looking to build large companies. We like founders who are thinking, uh, in some sense, breakthrough ideas. Uh, so, and who are passionate about what they're building. Uh, I have not seen a single company that has only gone one way in trajectory, uh, which is up north, right? That doesn't happen over the seven, eight period. So, you will face difficult time. Are you able to sustain it and so on? Uh, and in some sense, the founder who's truly thinking, not personally, but more for the company. Uh, and when that happens, I've seen, generally I've seen good, uh, uh, you know, uh, good businesses being built. So fundamentally good business, good thinking, some innovation. And then at least with Stellaris, I think we, we find a challenge if founders not thought through enough on their decisions. They may not have right all the answers, but at least the answers they have, they should have, you know, if I'm saying I build this product, then ideally you should have talked to 20 customers to see, get some validation. Mm. Uh, or if I want to build in this geography, that particular price point, then what are the reasons behind that? Uh, and that is not to say whether your decision was wrong or right. It is just to see how you take decisions. Is there a first principle thinking? Is there a logic? Where you don't have data, do you gather data in some other manner? Um, but basically improving your chance of success, right? If you are more logic-based, uh, you can always succeed once in a while uh, being irrational, illogical. But that is not, that is once in a life, like I can't predict it. So I would rather control the controller. Uh, does, uh, does a deck generally uh, convey uh, ambition of founder, how well they have thought, thought through uh, and you know whether they are being logical in the approach uh, like do you have any advice on how a founder should get you to agree to meet him like how should they uh, approach it so that you agree for a first meeting or a first call so when as I was we were earlier saying you know showing some hustle on how do you reach out okay. that matters hmm. uh, deck is interesting but I don't think that is the only important piece I think deck does convey lack of clarity or a lot of clarity okay. uh, 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 on founder's viewpoint. But I won't like anchor too much on the deck alone. Uh, so if an email can describe what you want to do and why you are best place to do it or a deck, it doesn't matter. Uh, 
So, you know, and see, we all have our own biases. So I may have a bias that this sector I don't like or this model I don't like. In which case, I might just say no on email. That also happens. But the good part about fundraising is you need to find one person who's convinced. Right. So you will hear 20 no's or 19 no's. You need to find that one person who says yes to you. Mm. Uh, right. Uh, so, and, and a little bit of preparation ahead of time on, you know, if you're meeting that investor, what stage they come in at, what have they done? Yeah, you should so study the investor. That helps you be better prepared in the meeting. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Rahul. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Akshay. Very nice talking to you.